very much. Uh, let me remind everybody online to use speaker view and also the host who's recording to use speaker view. It's my pleasure now to introduce uh, one of our favorite speakers, Reverend Bob Tucker. Bob is retired after serving the First Congregation Church in Houston for nearly 30 years. He and his wife Maggie visit us usually about once a month when Bob inspires us with his wisdom and experiences. He was the senior minister of the First Congregational Church of Houston for many years and also the interim minister at the First Unitarian Church in Houston. He has served churches in South Dakota, Minnesota, and Kansas, and he and Maggie taught several years in Turkey. He is also now the Executive Director Emeritus of the Foundation for Contemporary Theology. I'm waiting for Bob to unmute. Okay, clear now? For some reason I was pushing, this has not been a good morning. I was trying pushing the unmute button and it wasn't unmuting. Uh, earlier today, uh, the video on my computer was not functioning. I know why it was not functioning because I pushed the wrong button, but I couldn't get it back. So now I'm currently on my wife's computer uh, it doesn't have the uh, sound system and the uh, video of the other, but uh, we'll move along anyway. Uh, today's monthly, uh, this month's topic is courage to be and act. Within that general theme, I've chosen today the subject of power, a reality that is very pervasive in our lives. Uh, there's the rhetoric of President Biden setting the goal of shifting power from gas-fueled to electric-powered automobiles. There was a stoppage of power uh, in uh, February, two days at my house here in Houston, but I understand it was more days uh, there in Galveston. And then there were something like four and a half million homes uh, in uh, Texas as a whole. Then there are the articles about power in the Houston Chronicle. Uh, at least I get to read them. And there are articles on individual power, that is uh, changing your diet or getting more exercise. Uh, there's power on attorney, a uh, power of attorney. Uh, there's the power of story, an article on that. And there was also an article on the power of silence. Uh, apparently, I'm not following that one this morning. Uh, Senator Cruz just this week uh, roasted House Speaker Nancy Pelosi on the Senate floor, saying that she is drunk with power uh, for reinstating the mask mandate. And even in our UCC, purpose, a UU purpose, uh, we are to confront powers uh, and structures of evil. So power is not uh, absent from our life. It uh, tends to be quite pervasive. Uh, actually, we are immersed in and have experiences galore with power. Well, I'm going to uh, interpret uh, our use of personal power through two stories this morning, one from the Bible and the second from the 214 commencement at the University of Texas. In uh, first of all, uh, let me say a word about stories. Uh, it was Marcus Borg who uh, coined the phrase that many of the Bible stories are true, but not factual. True but not factual is a, a handy phrase to remember, for it uh, responds not only to the Bible, but also to American history and to our personal lives. Uh, how many of the stories that we tell ourselves are true 
but not factual. That is, over the years, they've been uh, manipulated in order to make ourselves the uh, hero, uh, to diminish the input of other people. I have, uh, I still remember times that I, in my office at the beginning of a memorial service and talking with the family and having there a couple of the uh, siblings get into an argument. Why? Because they are talking about something that happened with their parents and they disagree. Same incident, it's factual, uh, but uh, what they remember uh, is truth in their own way. Uh, our American history is full of uh, true but not factual remembrances. For example, at this particular time, we're learning a lot more about the War of 1812 uh, because of the incident in January. Uh, but even that is not when the British burned down the White House and uh, other buildings in Washington. Uh, but that's not the whole story. Just the year before, Americans had invite, invaded Canada and burned down the city of York, uh, the current uh, city of Toronto. And so what the British were doing was uh, burning down some of our cap capital buildings uh, in response to that action. So uh, the Bible is full also of stories that are true, but not factual. And I'm going to uh, tell one this morning. It's a story of the survival of Moses. Uh, Moses is a good Unitarian Universalist figure in the sense that he exemplifies a part of our living tradition. That is wisdom from the world's religions, which inspires us in our ethical and spiritual life. Well, Moses is actually a prominent person in three world religions, of course, in Judaism and Christianity, but also in Islam. For Moses is considered one of the uh, five great prophets, uh, Muhammad and Jesus, and you have Abraham and Noah and Moses. A Moses' infancy story is found in the second chapter of Exodus. Uh, prior to that, Joseph had arrived in uh, Egypt, being sold by his brothers into, uh, into servitude in Egypt. And over the years, the uh, descendants of Joseph populated the land. Uh, and because of their growing population and influence, were seen as an internal threat to the nation. Uh, some are saying what's happening in our border the same way in, uh, in this country. And so the leadership of, of Egypt was facing the question, how do you control the population? Well, the Pharaoh first tried uh, to do that with some oppression, but that didn't work. Uh, so then he thought he would try some population control uh, by ordering all midwives to kill all male babies. He had decreed that all the baby boys were to be thrown into the Nile uh, because he feared that with their growing numbers, uh, they would become too strong for the nation itself. The problem was that the midwives did not carry out Pharaoh's wishes. And on the call to account, they said, well, the Hebrew women were so strong uh, that they always gave birth uh, before the delivery date. When Moses was born, his mother uh, hid him for three months until uh, she could no longer uh, hide him. At this point, uh, Moses' sister Miriam stepped in and uh, in her, I, I think of adolescence, uh, exuberance and imagination, uh, she suggested to Moses' mother that he be placed in a uh, waterproof basket, put into the lagoon where Pharaoh's daughter uh, bathed. And she thought that perhaps her uh, heart would be so softened toward the child uh, that she would provide some shelter for it. 
Well, it worked. And she had the child bought to her. But what do you do with a hungry child wailing? Well, um, Miriam had another answer uh, for that. And she suggested that she knew a uh, Hebrew woman who had recently given birth and still had milk. And so why doesn't she become uh, the uh, surrogate mother at, at least for uh, milk? And uh, the Pharaoh's daughter uh, uh, agreed to that. And so it happened. And so when the weaning was over, Moses was delivered to Pharaoh's daughter. Uh, she decided then to adopt him. And thus begins Moses' life of privilege inside the royal community. A life of education, good food, and military training. Well, the story goes on, but I'm going to uh, end it there. Who's the hero in this story? Well, if you look at the Bible in the past, you found that at the title it said, Moses and the Bulrushes. And it's always referred to as the story of uh, the child Moses. And yet Moses just is a mewing baby. The real hero or heroes are the five ordinary women, uh, actually no account people, uh, who drove this story along. And each of them uh, did something not spectacular, but something that drove the story. Now think of uh, Sir uh, Shipra and Pua, the midwife, who disobeying the orders from above, an act of courage. Or Miriam, who in her adolescent sharp mind connived her way into the uh, scene that her brother Moses was uh, protected. And then think of Moses' mother, uh, who at, risked her son's life in order to perhaps give it life. Well, after all, Pharaoh's daughter could have seen that little basket out there in the water and said, get the damn uh, thing out of my sight and shove it out into the Nile. And then there's also uh, Pharaoh's daughter. Uh, it some, may sound like uh, this is a person of uh, privilege. Well, in a sense she was, but it's really elegant uh, uh, loneliness to be part of a royal family. You certainly see that in the uh, TV series in which uh, we see on the uh, in which we see the life of many of the women uh, somewhat uh, caught up in minor details all along. But there you have it, five women out of nowhere exercising their personal power in helping a child survive. Power exercised by the powerless. Not one of the women had any idea of the person that they would be protecting and furthering along. Well, now I want to uh, tell a different story, uh, a contemporary story. Uh, at your high school graduation or perhaps college graduation, do you remember who the speakers were or what it was they said? I don't remember either. Actually, I have no earthly idea. My guess, though, is that every single one of the graduates of the University of Texas still remembers their 2014 commencement speaker. And they remember the first part of his talk. Uh, at that commencement, uh, the speaker was the chancellor of the University of the Texas system, the whole system of 14 institutions, a student population of roughly 220,000 and employing 20,000 faculty plus three times. It would be easy to forget the speaker, even though he's a retired 
a four star admiral uh, because he was another bureaucrat ahead of the Texas system, William Harry McGrathen. And before him was a large assemblage of something like roughly 8,000 students, parents, faculty, uh, and uh, other workers at the university. What made the talk memorable was that they all heard something they had not believed in their wildest imagination they would hear. On that warm but not hot evening, uh, this retired four-star admiral, resplendent in his white dress uniform and gold braided cap, and being the current executive of the whole UT system, gave his talk. He spoke of his training as a SEAL and its applicability to life, to life, uh, everyday life. He said that in SEAL training, and this is the, his first point, the most important uh, first requirement each day was, and he is saying this to this large academic community and family, the first act is to make one's bed. Now, I think parents probably had two responses that one, well, finally someone is saying it other than they're saying it to their child. But the other thing is we, we skimped and saved and sent our child to the university so that he or she could listen to this to make their bed. There you have it. I'm certain that a lot of parents were ready to, to roll their eyes and give up on at this. Each morning, he's suggesting to the children, that they, to the students, that they're to make their bed. Well, McGrathen goes on to talk about other aspects of SEAL training and their applicability to the life of service. And it really was a very good uh, speech. But what he said was that into seals was that the making of one's bed and made perfectly was an act of power. Making one's bed started each day first with accomplishing a task. And secondly, bringing to the day some order. Making one's bed was a Bob, you, you're muted. And, and there's a background noise like your papers are rustling. Okay, I'm back. Did you hear that? How, when did you stop hearing? Just about a uh, half minute ago. Oh, okay. Well, it's, it's just that, uh, uh, he was saying that there are two things that were drilled into these uh, future warrior minds. Uh, one is that by making your bed, you're starting the day with a sense of order. And uh, you're also giving something, accomplishing something at the beginning of the day. And you can carry that forward uh, through the hours. It was an unusual speech. And as I said, I think that probably every graduate will remember who gave it and at least what the beginning of the speech was. And so I've told two stories. One of five unimportant individuals exercising power and accomplishing something of great importance. And one important person who is exercising uh, and, re and re uh, telling people to do an unimportant task. In neither case is it how we think of personal power. Power generally is thought of as taking place in the halls of Washington or Austin, as having substantial wealth as transmitted 
in the lines that bisect our view of the city of momentarily escaping this earth. But what is common in the stories that I have told is that power is, the or is ordinary and it's exercised in ordinary tasks, making, like making one's bed. If I had to choose a text for uh, today's talk, it would be from the 19th century poet, Emily Dickinson. And she wrote this in the, this poem, to be alive is power. Existence in itself without a further function, omnipotence enough. Let me read again, that again since poetry is difficult to grasp. To be alive is power. Existence in itself without further function, omnipotence enough. I don't think that I'm out of uh, line to suggest that most of us, probably much of the time, feel the absence of power, the impotence of ordinariness. Uh, we feel the erosion of power through uh, aging. We see in these stories of Moses and of the Admiral speaking to the graduating class of the University of Texas, that there's another way of looking at power. Well, I want to start stop with one additional story. And this is one that probably is familiar to all of you, the story of Cabeza de Vaca. For he landed, he was part of an expedition to Florida uh, in which the Spanish conquistadors were going to take that land and enrich themselves as they had in other places. But it was a disastrous all the way along. And finally, Cabeza and three other members of the, the larger group that started out uh, got on a boat, a small boat, and drifted across the Gulf of Mexico, dry, stopping at di different ports or different places and being driven off by the Indians. And finally, they reached that little sandy island called, that we call Galveston. For two years, he was essentially a slave. But he had a different spirit about him, and they found that perhaps because of his uh, strange ways, uh, he had an ability to heal as well. And so they said, uh, you're going to be our healer. And he said, we can't do that. Uh, we have not been to the university, and we do not have a certificate. And they said, well, heal or die. And he writes in his memoir, we began to heal. We were more than we thought we were. Well, I thank you very much for your attentiveness. <laughs>